good morning. Good to have you here with us at Hardison Baptist Church. <clears throat> Take your hymn books and let's start with 353. So stand with me and we'll sing Victory in Jesus. 353. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he Beneath the cleansing flood. All right, so we're singing victory in Jesus. What a victory we have in Jesus. Let's sing it like we... Y'all are singing well, but your faces look like you're thinking about the defeat from Satan this morning. Amen, preacher. Let's sing Thank about you. that Thank victory you. in Jesus. Yes. On the second verse. I heard an old his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about the mansions He has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. And about the angels singing and the old redemption story. song of victory in oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him he me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Well, amen. Good song to start off with. Well, truly we have victory in Jesus Christ and the finished work at Calvary. If you know him as your Savior today, amen. amen. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Good to have our visitors with us today. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer this morning. Uh, Father, we thank you for the day. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for everyone that's assembled here together. Lord, I thank you for those that are watching on live stream. Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts today, draw us closer to you. And Lord, particularly uh, as we partake of the Lord's Supper at the end of the service, God, I pray it be a very special time to each person here. Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you as Savior, God, I pray that you get a hold of their heart. Lord, I pray that you help them to realize they're lost and on their way to hell without you. But there is hope that you paid their sin debt, Lord. And God, I pray that today would be the day that they would choose you and repent, turn to you for salvation. God, we love you. 
I pray for your power in the meeting this morning, Lord, in the singing and in the preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah, you may be seated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We can do things different than we normally do. That's okay. Well, we're not supposed to, but because we're Baptists. I'm sorry. Did I say that? <laughs> no, no, it's a good thing to do them different. 297. Going with the theme of what we're going to celebrate later with the Lord's Supper. Are you washed in the blood? 297. Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? And be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? Are you in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. And I hope that your resounding answer to that question is, yes, yes I am. 310, we slow it down just a little bit. Still thinking about what Christ did for us through his body and his blood. 310, Amen. the old Amen. rugged cross. Stand with me as we sing all three verses of the old rugged cross. I lay down I 
give announcements at the beginning of the service. I'll give you real quickly, uh, p.m. service tonight, as you see, we're all having the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, but then p.m. service tonight, 6 o'clock, um, ladies' Bible study, 1030 here at the church, Tuesday morning, I guess they tell you not just the time, but the date, but you know it. We ain't ladies, the, the meeting, monthly meeting is this Saturday at 1030, isn't it? 1030 in the fellowship hall, trunk or treat. The first Saturday of uh, next month, so you got a while before, ahead of that. And if you'd like to bring some candy and things, participate with that for for that purpose. We we'll have chili cook off following that too. But uh, anyway, the trunk or treat box boxes out there. If you want to bring any candy and give for that, we appreciate it. And uh, I guess that's about it. You probably see some strange faces around the property through the week. Next week, uh, electrician will be in and around doing some things. Will be the sound system's going to be install Friday the 7th, Friday the 7th, and uh, the classes afterwards. Anybody that's interested in learning and watching at the end of it, um, I don't know what time they'll be through. I don't know if they'll be through at 3 o'clock or 7 o'clock that night. I don't know, but if you want to text me through the day to find out, I'll be here with them through the day except for when I'm on the school bus. Uh, if you, you know, give you a time of when you can be here to see everything, you know, the operations of it and all. And uh, hopefully the vinyl side guy will be here this past week. He's had some trouble with his truck for about two weeks now that hauls a long walk board that he needs for this job. So hopefully he'll be through here. I hope, hope to get all that taken care of that will be done with this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Get it behind us. Uh, well, today's a special day, the Lord's Supper, communion, as we call it. And it's called in the Bible. It's called both, the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper, communion. Uh, but if you would turn your Bible this morning to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. When you find your place. Stand, if you would, Hebrews chapter 10. I want to read two verses, and they're not together, but kind of go together. We'll go back and read more of it in a little while, but right now in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then verse 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And I want to 
preached there, and one mentions the body, one mentions the blood. I realize the holiness is talking about going in rightly before the throne of God, and the holiness is the Old Testament priests could only go, were the only ones that could go in after a certain amount of washings and ceremonial things could they go in, but Christ removed that petition, and he, uh, he, he took that, that veil down uh, when he died, and when he rose again, it was through him, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can go in before him. So I just want to preach this morning on simply on the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning. God, I pray that you'd remove every distraction. Lord, I pray that those that might be bitter this morning would be better and be happy. I pray that those that are distracted, Lord, would be really concerned and desire to hear from the Word of God. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, and help us in a way, God, that we wouldn't understand and we couldn't purposely do on our own, that we'd be focused on the preaching of the Word of God this morning. God, help me to preach in your power. God, help me to preach truth. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach with conviction and compassion. And God, I pray that we'd all have ears and hearts to listen for the same. God, help us this morning. That it not just be a routine time that this is what we do today, but it be a special day in your house with your children as we're gathered here together as a local church. God, help us this morning. Help me to preach. Lord, I need you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to go back and read Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, verses 1 through 20. I want you to pay attention as I read, and there's a few things about the blood. It's pretty obvious as we read through this that uh, uh, just any blood wouldn't do. It took a special blood. It took the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son. But I want to read through. I might make a few comments as we go through here. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereof thereunto perfect. They had to go every year. There was no, there was no re redemption. There was just remission. It just, it just bought them time over till next year that they'd go through what the Lord had told them to do. And in verse 2 says, For then, uh, for then when they uh, not have, wait a minute, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should not have no more conscience of sins, or should not have no more conscience of sins. But in those, the, those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. They, they, there was no remission. didn't take care. didn't fix the conscience for us. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering... Thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And it says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Now he's quoting there from Psalm 40, verse 6, right there. And then verse 7, Then said I, lo, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And that's Psalm 40, verse 7, quoting from that. Well, there's a great statement in that and a great message itself in that, that talking about Jesus and a prophecy and, and then and, and where it's written in the Psalms. But then here, uh, looking back, as it's uh, already taken place, where it says, I come in the volume of the book, and I remind you that the whole volume of the book, the whole every bit of the book is about Jesus Christ, is about him to come, it's about him while he was here, and it's about him coming again one day. In verse 8, Above, it says, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said I, lo, I come, in, come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And that's Psalm 40, verse 8. It says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He need not die again. He's already taken care of that. It was sufficient. It got the job done. If you're saved, you're saved eternally because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a perfect salvation. In verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Wow. 
Well, I'm glad I was born in the age of grace. Aren't you in this church age? Aren't you? And rather than under the law. In verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of the throne of God, or right hand of God. I added the throne, sorry about that. Uh, verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstools, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Boy, I, just, I don't know about you, but I get excited reading through this. Realize how I got saved, how long I'm saved, uh, what the method, the propitiation, every all of it's just right there. In verse 15, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, let me say that. We talk about, I know there's a song about in the sea of God's forgetfulness, in the, talking about our sins being in the sea of God's forgetfulness. God never forgot anything. He remembered it no more. That's an option you and I don't have. We, we, we remember things no more, but it's not because we chose that option. It's the way our brains operate as we grow more years behind us. But, but people say that God forgets our sin. No, God doesn't forget. It's more powerful that he chooses to remember no more those sins that are under the blood. Uh, well, let me find my verse there. Uh, verse 18, now, when, now where remission of, sin, of these is, there is no more offering for sins. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, I'll stop at verse 22, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And now that pure water, make no mistake, that's not backing. Don't, don't make the mistake of think that's talking about being baptized and washed or baptismal regeneration. If you go to Ephesians 5, 26, you'll see what that blood is. But it's the washing regeneration by the word of God, the truth of the word of God. God is that cleansing agent. But we see there that it's just not any blood. Those blood of goats and bulls and of animals didn't do the job. It was just a part of the law. It got them through it. got them remission of sin. It held the sin over until next year when they came by. But praise God for that per perfect, precious blood of Jesus Christ that takes, away, it takes it away and takes the conscious effect out of it. And he's put us himself. He's written his conscience in our, in our minds and our hearts and all. And, and, man, and, and when, he, when we got saved, he, he abode. He took up a boat in us and indwells us as the Holy Spirit of God. Praise God for salvation. Several facts are brought forth by the Bible concerning blood, some of these specifically Jesus' blood, and then some blood in general. And, and uh, man, we, we take it a lot. You know, when you cut a little place on our hand and see a drop of blood, we really don't think about the fullness of that blood and what that blood entails. No, we just think a little something that leaked out of us, and boy, it's far more than that, but particularly when you're talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. Genesis 9, 4 says, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Now, you see more of that in the law and talking about eating the blood, and blood, the flesh was supposed to have been drained free of the blood before they ate it and all, but the point I want to use that is the, the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood, meaning point and tell us that the blood is the, the, the very fact of life in us. If that blood's gone, there is no more life. That blood makes our, lets our brains think, lets our hands move, lets our arms move, lets us live, lets our lungs work. That, that blood is the life. If you can't leak but so much of it and keep on living. Leviticus 17, the Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the souls. We see that there was a, the blood was the chosen agent of God Almighty to make atonement for, for sin. 
And Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. Now, there was, there was atonement made, for the, made by the blood of the goats and lambs and all that. But when you come down to redemption, that story chain says, For in whom we have redemption through his blood. It paid the price for our sin. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Or yes, the forgiveness, specifically the forgiveness of sins. Revelation 1 and 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I started it. Well, I started in Genesis. Let's get back to Genesis. Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And those that would deny Capital punishment for certain levels of crime and all that. Well, there's the Bible. There you go. God said it first, didn't he? That if man sheds man's blood, men should shed his blood for that cause. But let's go. That's a whole other subject. Let's look at some scientific facts concerning blood this morning. I, I mentioned that we see sometimes as I might, uh, you know, working on a car or something. Might, well, may, maybe not your ladies. You might be reaching in the drawer to get a knife out or something and uh, cut, it, cut it on a, there somewhere. Some of you might work on your cars. I don't know. But wherever you might, you might get a little nick on your knuckles or whatever and, and drop a little drop of blood or form. Or as we get older, for some reason, it flows a little more and more. Used to, it quit bleeding about 30 seconds. It was done. Now you look over in an hour, 15 minutes later, you got a big old string down your arm. And some of y'all are saying, welcome to life, young man. <laughs> John Phillips, I don't know how many of y'all have heard of him, great, if you like reading Christian authors and Christian uh, commentators and just people that write of godly things, John Phillips is a great uh, author, uh, he's British born, uh, spent a lot of time at uh, Moody Bible Institute and several different places, but a great preacher of yesteryear, has been, been with the Lord probably about 10 years now. But he said this about the blood of Jesus and about the blood itself, really. He said, blood is unique in the complex chemistry of life. There are other fluids in the body, saliva, tears, gastric juices, and so on. But these are all products of the body. Blood is part of the body, just as hands, hair, are part of the body. It, the blood, contains both red and white cells, and it's constantly in motion. Each of the billions of red blood cells in the body live for only about 120 days, then dies and is replaced. The chemistry of the blood is extremely complex. Hemoglobin alone is made up of thousands of atoms of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, iron, oxygen, and silver. So if you think you ain't worth nothing, you do have a little bit of silver in your body. <laughs> each of these atoms has to be hooked up to its neighbor's atoms, neighbor atoms in exactly the right way. Such a substance couldn't just happen. And man, when you read the science of the body, when you read about the, the blood and those things like that, to think that, that two bodies bumped into each other and caused an explosion and that tadpoles came out of the ocean and millions of years later put on a three-piece suit and, and uh, spoke and talked and walked upright. That's a religion in itself and it's a religion in his head is, is the devil himself. That is a very much, it takes more faith to believe that God said, let there be light and there was light. I'm glad God created all that he did and the glory that he did because it points back to his glory that could be shared with no other. But there's so much there, and I know that's hard to get a hold of that much, that many facts, little things about blood, but blood's very important. It's very complex. It's not just a, 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 a spit or other things. There are tears or whatever we might have. It's, very, it's part of the body. It's, it's the life of the body. It's, it's vital for life and it's very complex. It is life. Now let's consider the blood of Jesus Christ this morning for a few minutes. The blood of Jesus Christ, number one, it was sinless blood. Sinless, spotless, and this speaks of his impeccability. He was without sin, without the ability to sin. He, he had no sin nature itself like you and I have. 
1 Peter 1, 19, the Bible says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, uh, when we see that, it's just grace, the precious blood, and, and as a lamb, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And well, I believe right there we're referring back to Exodus chapter 12, which was the first Passover when the true Passover took place of that time. Uh, the original that the Passover feast became modeled after when the blood was shed that, that was put over the side post and the door post of the, over the top post of the doors and the, uh, when the death angel flew over that those that was under the blood, uh, the death angel would pass over them. And we know nowadays the Christ, if the blood's been applied, spiritually speaking, of Jesus Christ, uh, the death angel passes over, we're alive forevermore. We have a second birth where we're new and alive in Jesus Christ. But it's sinless blood. Jesus' blood was unique. Uh, each of our blood is unique. Well, I was reading where the a DNA strand, I, I can't remember the exact figures which said, but it said if you took a DNA strand of one person and put it end to end, it would go like around Earth, and I forget which planet, so many times it would be so long. There's a lot of information in, in our blood, in our DNA. And God made all that. He made it with purpose. He made it, I mean, it's amazing what they can find out by DNA. But Christ's blood, uh, he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. In the womb of a virgin. Now there's some, there's some interesting studies to do in the Word of God. And I want to I be careful here and not that make this, uh, be real dogmatic about this. But my personal take, if you study uh, conceived, the word conceived, if you look through in the Bible uh, and go through, all the time that word's used, it's always like she conceived, she conceived, and so and so, this this conceived. But when it gets to Mary, it rare, it's only a couple places that's worded even similar to that. It just mentions that there was a child conceived. And I, I've said this before, and I, I was questioning on it one time, rightfully so. Uh, I'd said that, that, that when, because Jesus was born of a virgin and of the Holy Ghost, he didn't have the fathers that goes back to Adam. He didn't have uh, that bloodline in him. And somebody asked one time, well, what about the DNA of Mary? Wouldn't that still go back to Adam because we all come from Adam and Eve? That's a very legitimate question. Well, I, I tried to study this. I'm not through studying on this because it's a pretty deep subject. It's one you may say, well, it really doesn't, uh, you don't have to know the answer to that to go to heaven. No, that's true. But I, but I want to prove and understand and know it in my heart. But, but uh, the Bible refers to Jesus Christ as the second Adam. There was the first Adam, then the second Adam. And I, I personally believe, and I, 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 I don't hold me to this, but I think it's food for thought that I believe in the Holy Spirit of God. Typically, the woman has the egg, and there's the X and Y chromosomes, and one determines it's by the Father, determines whether it's a male or female, and it gets into a lot of science and all that. It's way over my head, but what I'm try, trying to say is the woman has the, the egg, and uh, traditionally in the Old Testament, it says the seed of man uh, causes a conception of the woman's egg, but I'm not sure that it was Mary's egg. I believe when God put Jesus in there, that God created, that the Holy Ghost conceived, put that whole Jesus Christ in there, that he wasn't of the DNA of Mary, that he was of a pure, the Bible says the second Adam, Adam didn't have a DNA lineage back to another man. God created Adam, and I believe when it's talking about a second Adam, part of that is not only was the sinless perfection of that, that Adam was created in, but he was given, a, he was a free moral agent and given a choice, and he sinned and he messed that up messed me and you up, uh, pulled us all into sin, but Christ as the second Adam was created as such and was conceived of the Holy Ghost of God called the second Adam. And I don't believe he had a DNA lineage from Mary or Joseph, obviously not from Joseph, but back either way. Now you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, I can't prove it, but I want to study that more because I think it's a great study in the Word of God, and it's just uh, amazing. But I, what I do know, whether it came from however how the DNA got there or whatever, whatever DNA was of Jesus' blood consisted of and all that, the bottom line is he had no sin nature. He was without sin. If he had sin, you and I are hopelessly on our way to hell because it would not have satisfied God's requirement for a perfect lamb of God to be sacrificed to pay for our sin. Can I get an amen right there? Y'all so quiet sometimes I have to ask for an amen. But I don't, I, if, if I have to ask to get one long, somebody says amen, it shows some excitement about Jesus Christ. Hey, amen, I'm good with that. 
It was sinless blood. Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost in the womb of a virgin. Number two, it was a shed blood. I know there's a great song. I can't think of the title of it right now, but there's a great song where it talks about the blood being spilt. And I know the song reader, song reader, songwriter probably was trying to find a rhyme there. I don't think they meant it into such word that it was spilt like, whoops, got a little cut there. He spilled a little bit. My friends, and I don't discredit that song or songwriter for that and, and uh, you know, try to find such a minute thing to uh, I'd, I'd rather die on a lot bigger mountain than that one, I promise you that. But I, but I know one thing, it wasn't spilt by accident or nothing, anything like that. It was a shed blood. It's by his choice. He was born to die on Calvary that day, but it was shed for you and I. Luke, Luke 22, uh, verse 20, the Bible says, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, he said that before he shed his blood, but he freely gave of and freely shed of his blood for my sin and for yours on old bloody Calvary that day as he was laid open by the cat of nine tails as they put the uh, crown of thorns on his head and, and uh, put that on there. And boy, we see such a type of that ram caught in a thicket there in Genesis 22, don't we? God has always required a blood sacrifice for sin. Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they, they were naked and didn't realize, didn't see that. And it's hard for our minds in this society. It's hard for us to comprehend and understand that. But when they disobeyed God and were made as gods and knew that all, before, all they'd known before was they'd known good. They'd not known good and evil. But after they disobeyed God, they had the knowledge of good and evil. And they were this newfound nakedness they came about. They knew something was wrong there. They should be covered, so they sewed what together? Fig leaves and made coverings. Now, God didn't say this, but I'm, para- I'm, I'm acting out the thought there. God said, that's not enough, my child. And he took the, lamp, the coats of animals and made them coverings. It took bloodshed to cover their sin. And it goes on with their children, with, that, with Cain and Abel. Cain offered sacrifices of the fruit of the ground, of his offerings, of his farming, we could say. While Abel offered sacrifices that was of his firstlings of his flock, which required bloodshed. And we know from that passage that God accepted Abel's but not Cain's. Cain got jealous, and what did he do? He killed him, didn't he? But we see there that it took shed blood. The, the first incident there in the garden, the second incident with their child that was recorded in the Word of God, and it's always taken, God has always required a blood sacrifice to cover sin. And then on old bloody Calvary, that perfect blood, that blood of the spotless, sinless Lamb of God did the job once. The Hebrews uses the word once several times. But he did it once. It wasn't a fading power. He did it once. There's no power that'll overpower it. He did it once. We don't have to go back for that blood after saved. He did it once. It was a shed blood. It was a sinless blood. Well, just to, I mean, to where the rubber meets the road, number three, Romans chapter five, verse nine, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, I believe that's talking about eternal wrath. I believe that's also got to do with the uh, uh, pre trib rapture, is found, I believe, in that, a prophecy of that to take place. Uh, but nonetheless, number three, well, this is kind of a quick point here, but it's a saving blood. I'm glad I got saved. I'm glad for the blood. But for the blood. I, I like that old song. I, I like to sing it sometimes. Uh, if I hadn't sang it so many times already, I might would have sang it again this morning without the blood. Boy, I'd never know my Savior. I'd never go to heaven. Boy, I'd never had my sins forgiven without the blood. There'd be no forgiveness of sin without the blood. It's a saving blood. Praise God. Lastly, this morning, you may want to turn to Genesis chapter 4. I've tried to kind of keep things rolling this morning. Realize we've got the Lord's Supper, and I didn't want to 
shorten or make less of the message, but I don't want to extend it all out and have you turn five or six times for one verse. But in Genesis chapter 4, lastly, it's a, it's a speaking blood. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, And the Lord said unto... I'll give you a second, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Now, you know, and I know that's a rhetorical question. He knew the answer. He was pulling on the heartstrings of Abel when he, Cain when he asked him that. He said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Let me tell you somebody, if there's somebody you don't want to be a smart aleck to, it's God. And there's two or three instances in the Bible where people did just that. And, and with Jesus, it's, I don't want to use the word funny here, but it's almost a little bit humorous to me. Like, man, I mean... I got in trouble a few times in school. Maybe I talked back to a teacher or something. And you find out there's some folks you don't talk back to, but God's one of them. You know, I admit I talked back to some teachers maybe a couple of times. Shouldn't have not said it's a good thing, and maybe that's what my problem is on the school bus. Maybe I'm just reaping what I sowed, right? <laughs> Genesis chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? Listen to this. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Wow. The blood cries. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24 and 25. The Bible says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Let me read that again. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. Well, it goes back to Sunday school, doesn't it? Blessed be the Holy Ghost, the unpardonable sin to reject him utterly that you have nothing to do with him. See that you refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. A little bit different context there. But the point there that blood speaketh better things than that of Abel. All right, Christ has shed his blood. It's referred to here as a speaking blood. Abel's blood was shed and God said his blood crieth from the ground. Abel's blood cried for punishment. Christ's blood cries for pardon. Abel's blood spoke. God could hear it. Whether it was audible and whether it made decibels and wiggle the sound cords of life, I don't know. But God heard it. He spoke of the blood crying from the ground. Christ's blood speaks. It was shed by wicked people. But it's not crying for retribution. It's crying for our redemption. Even those that as they were shedding his blood, he sought their forgiveness for them that was, that was killing him that, on, that, on the very cross. He was paying their sin debt and, and mentioned them being forgiven for they knew not what they were doing. but it was shed by wicked people, but it's not crying for retribution, Christ's blood. And there is a retribution. There is a pay for sin. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you can make the choice to pay for your sin for all eternity in a place called hell. But that shed with blood, and it's a crying blood, and the Holy Spirit of God's a drawing Holy Ghost, and it's crying for our redemption my friends, I want you to know that if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, He paid your sin debt. He cares for you. He loves you so much. God loves you so much. He gave His only begotten Son. And then Romans teaches us that's how He displayed, that's how He commended His love for us. That he died on the cross of Calvary. While we were yet sinners, no one was sinners, He died for our sins. 
Abel's blood cried from the ground. Christ's blood cries from glory. Praise God for the drawing of the Holy Spirit and the blood that finished, that was a finished work on Calvary. Oh, dear sinner, I just ask you today, do you know Christ that shed his precious blood for you? That blood was a required payment for God to release you from sin's prison. If you're here today and don't know him, you've never been saved, you're locked up in a prison. You already know that. Sin's taking a toll on you, and you ain't seen nothing yet. But praise God, there's hope. Jesus died for you. It'll save you today if you'll cry out for him for forgiveness. In a few minutes, we're going to have another time of invitation. I want to go into the Lord's Supper and the early parts of that, and, and we'll have a time of invitation. If you're here today and don't know that Jesus is your Savior, you've never accepted his payment of your sin, never trusted him, you're just trying to work it out on your own, you ain't going to do it. You won't live enough, you won't do good enough works, you and five men more just like you will never earn a day in heaven. It's only paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to pray and dismiss from that part of the service. We'll go over and we'll come back and have an invitation time again. But Father, thanks for the day. Thanks for the truth of the word of God. Lord, I thank you for that blood that was shed. God, that we might be free. And Lord, you said it in a way that you did the work, but you did it in a way that us by faith just trusted you with our heart and that blood applied and we're cleansed. God, I thank you that it's that way because we'd never do anything worthy of your salvation. But thank you for the worthy Son of God that you died in our place. Lord, help us as we go on in this part of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians 11, I'm going to start reading that at verse 23, and we read through. Uh, the Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, that same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus, I mean of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep the Lord's Supper is one of the two ordinances of the New Testament local church uh, one is the uh, well one is the Lord's Supper or communion and the other's believer's baptism, after a person's trusted Christ as Savior, that they be baptized. Uh, believer bapti baptism is a submersion in water, bringing up out of the water that, that signifies the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, also signifying the dying of the old man, of the old sinner, and starting over as a new creature in Christ. The believer's baptism is also a prerequisite to Church membership in a local church first must be must first believe and they be baptized and we get that model from Acts chapter two. The Lord's Supper uh, typifying several things having to do with the uh, the Lord, and we'll look at these for a minute. Um, in First Corinthians eleven here in verse twenty five. 
It says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take ye, this is my body which was broken for you, this to remember me. It's a time that we reflect back and look back at what has taken place that, that I preached about the blood of Jesus. We reflect on Christ and what he did for us as we look at the body and the blood that was shed and the body that was broken. Uh, he died in awful agony so we might live in great victory. Brother Bryant, you were you just beat me to the punch this morning when we were singing the Lord, the victory in Jesus. I was thinking, man, their looks on their faces, the way they're singing, I don't see a lot of victory in here, so I appreciate you getting a little kick start and, and uh, you know, getting fired up a little bit. Sometimes you have to do that. But, boy, we come to the house of God with victory, and we're saying victory in Jesus. Boy, we ought to be excited. We ought to be smiling. I was thinking I'm glad live stream was facing, was facing out here and not looking out at your faces because they just flicked the channel and went to another one. But Brother Bryant, you kicked them in gear. We had victory in Jesus. Boy, children of God, we ought to look back and see what Jesus did and say, praise God, hallelujah to the Lamb. And I like that song too, by the way, hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise God for what he did for us on Calvary some 2,000 years ago. Then verse 26 so for as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. It's a look forward. Well, we have that blessed hope, the soon return of Jesus Christ. We've got that, that great event we're looking for. Now, we might go by the grave, some of us, but we might go by the rapture. We don't know. But I like that other old song, I'm a winner either way. It matters not. Well, it does matter. I'd rather go by the... I'd rather go by the rapture. I'd rather fly than die. But if my lot's to go in the grave, uh, so long, old body, because I'm out of him. I'll be present with the Lord. And if you know Christ, you will be too. Thank you. Thank you. Then in verse 27, it says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself. Let me read that again. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that eat of that bread and drink that cup. So there's an order there. A man examine himself, and then and then so let him eat and eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly amongst us. And many sleep, but we look back at Christ and what he did for us on Calvary. We look forward that he's, he's, he's returning. He's a soon returning Savior. And we ought to take this time specifically to, as a look inward, examine ourselves. Ask God to shine that illuminating flashlight of the Holy Ghost of God and point out those things that might be there that need to be fixed. I, I'd say, first of all, a person needs to know they're saved. And not have any unconfessed sin. Might be somebody who might be in here and have bitterness in your heart, and uh, some type, whatever type of unconfessed sin it might be. Well, we're going to open an altar. We're going to have a time. By the way, this altar is always open. I've had people come down right while I was preaching, right down, right there, and said, "Brother," I said Uncle Jim. I actually said, "Uncle Jim, I got to get saved." I said, "Well, that's more important. Than my preaching right now. We dealt with that. This altar is always open." But specifically at this time, I'm not in just a minute. We're going to open the altar, and I, I see you might have unconfessed sin. Well, First John one nine still in the Bible. Well, we can take it before the feet of Jesus, can't we? And seek Him for forgiving, for cleanness, all unrighteousness from all unrighteousness. So I want to do that. So if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I want to take a minute. Let's open the altar if you're here today. If you've never been saved, boy, you need to get saved. Matter of fact, we'll put this whole thing on hold for one sinner to get saved this morning. If you're here today and never get saved, got been saved, come see me. If you're a female, feel better. Well, a lady, come see my wife and several other men and several other ladies in here that would love to counsel you at the altar and show you the word of God how you can know your sins forgiven today. But maybe you're here today and you're saved. But just whatever it might be, you need to get things cleared up with the Lord. I'm going to open the altar. Let's have time, time and, and a meet in the altar. If you're not physically able to make that, the Lord understands, and certainly I do too. If you're not able, physically able, you don't have to. Ain't the, I heard a preacher a long time ago said, ain't the position of the body, it's the position of the heart. But I do love the altar. 
And I believe God honors altar. But anyway, nonetheless, this time the altar is open. And if you need to do business with the Lord and uh, come down and anything in your heart, you need to get straight for. Amen. I'm going to ask the deacons, Brother Bob, and Brother Brian, if y'all come forward and uncover the table. Thank you, men. Appreciate you helping. Appreciate our deacon and his wife that prepared everything for this morning's service. Let's talk about the elements. You'll see different containers up there. One contains juice. I'm going to add to that. Brother Bob was telling me that Welch is, a, I would always buy whatever, but always a pure grape juice, fruit of the vine, the Bible says. And he said he liked Welch's brand because a part of their vision in starting was for churches to have a pure, ju pure juice to use in their or Supper and Communion services, and I thought that's pretty interesting. But regardless of what it is, it's not fermented wine. And this juice is the fruit of the vine that represents the purity of Jesus' blood. Why would you use something that's fermented that's not a purity anymore? And I don't want to get into all that. It's a whole other message this morning. But it's purity representing the blood of Jesus Christ. No fermentation. This is a representation of sin and it's pictured in the Bible. And then the other is bread. It's an unleavened bread. has no yeast in it. Leaven, you know, through the Bible in many places referred to as a, a type and a picture of sin. Uncleanness is uh, represented by that. And this unleavened bread that represents the pureness of Jesus' blood and of his body and his life. So men, if you would this morning, if you'd pass out the bread, please. While they're passing out, I'd say also, the, as I'd mentioned earlier in Exodus 12, when they were the Hebrew children in bondage, and there was the ten plagues, that last plague being the death angel, and all the firstborn ch children and firstborn animals would die. But he told the Hebrews to take that special sinless, that's not sinless, but the spotless lamb, and at a certain date to kill that lamb, get the blood, 
and put it over the side post and top post of the door. And that's where Passover came from. The word Passover is the death angel will pass over that firstborn where the blood was at. And the Hebrews were instructed to do that, the Israelites. And when the death angel came, came over, that was the tenth plague. It's a whole other story there. But, but the bottom line, they, they lived because the blood was applied. And that was the beginning of Passover. They were instructed to carry that out from year, on, year to year. It was a foreshadow of Christ to come. But then Christ was the ultimate Passover as he shed his blood that was put on that mercy seat. And I believe when we get to heaven, we'll see that blood on that mercy seat. And that blood being applied is the way that we passed over death, we passed under life. So it's kind of, uh, one was looking forward to Christ to come, and now we're doing this looking back at Christ that died for us. Matthew 25, verse 26. Or 26, I'm sorry, I did the wrong chapter. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. But he blessed it. And I want to just ask Brother Bob if you'd pray. Ask God's blessing on this. It represents the body, please. To take and eat, eat all of it. Brother, if you could pass out the juice that represents the blood.
In verse 27, 28, it says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many by the remi for the remission of sin. So I'm going to ask Brother Brian if you'd ask God a blessing on this, represents the blood. Yes. We ask you to pray for us. Amen. It says, drink ye all of it. Verse 29 and 30. It says, but I will say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day that when I drink it, new with you in my Father's kingdom. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives uh, we know that after this time, as tradition of the Jews continued on, they sang Psalm 113 through 118. Psalm, and I think it's called the Halle, if I'm saying that right, passage. But it starts off, the first word of Psalm 113 is Halle, in, in the Hebrew that is. And the next word, of course, being Luyah, they, been Hallelujah says uh, praise the Lord and goes on from there. Of course, Hallelujah means praise ye the Lord. Uh, but anyway, they would sing that. I don't know the tune of that, so I just like to sing Amazing Grace. I think it works fine for that. But they actually had an order that they sang it in, and uh, uh, I believe today uh, Jewish, Jewish folks still do that when they do the Passover, sing those passages. But if you would, take your hymnal. I'll just lead you a cappella this morning. In, uh, page 130 is Amazing Grace. We'll just sing. Well, sister, you're at the piano. We'll use. We'll have music then. It'll be fine. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers tolls and snares I have already come the grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home on the last. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Hold on just a second, sister. You know, and the more I study the Lord's Supper, the more I understand about it and the way and the, what the pastor was doing when they, uh, the cup, when they blessed, it really had to do with the person blessing and thanking God and the congregation would bless and thank Him together more so than just a prayer for it. Nothing wrong with praying for it, sir. But I believe also part of the meaning of the Lord's Supper is of gratitude, thankfulness to draw us closer to him, thanking him for what he's done for it, for us. So with that being said, let's sing the sixth verse, which is just simply praise God. And I'm sure you know it. 
Praise God, 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 praise God. Amen. Appreciate you all being here this morning. The sweet service. Appreciate the Lord meeting and helping us this morning. Brother Wayne Giles, how about if you dismiss a word of prayer, please, brother?